Liège Baston Liège is not quite the oldest classic race in the world. That's the revered Paris Rouen amateur race. But it is the most wanted classic. Since 1892, the finest riders in the world have battled to win the race. Hi, everybody. I'm Phil Liggett, and it's great to be back with you once more. This 1993 edition, the 79th of Liège Baston Liège, has again brought together 106 of the most noted names in the sport. Miguel Indurain, getting ready to try and win the Tour de France for a third successive year, has yet to win here in the Belgian Ardennes. Moreno Argentin, the classic specialist, has won four times. Can he now join Eddie Merckx, the great Belgian, with a record five? And there's Rolf Sorensen, former teammate of Argentin, Sorensen has now changed teams and hopes to become the first Danish rider to win this race in the history of La Doyenne. And of course, there's the great Italian, Claudio Chipucci, the aggressive rider who needs a classic win to make him really great. Now, let's join the action of this year's race. <laughs> aussi qui fait partie de, de la course mais quelle image impressionnante de Yann Matthäus qui est à bout, complètement à bout il est, regardez, on vous l'indique dans le passage le plus dur I'm looking now at the sorry side there of Jan Matthäus, the La William rider from Belgium for five years a professional who's only ever won two races and coming to an end now is breakaway which has lasted almost exactly 100 miles and the riders who are going to catch him are just about the best riders in this race this year. Tony Rominger setting the pace, who's having a tremendous season. And there is the sorry side just up the road of Jan Matthias of La William and Belgium. You always get a Belgian rider who will try to distinguish himself in Liège Baston Liège. He broke away after seven miles. He gained a maximum lead of 18 minutes. For a while he was chased by the Italian rider Dotti. But now the 28-year-old who finished last in this event a year ago is now being wiped out by what seems to be the advanced party in the age based on the age as we make up the climb here of stocker there are 10 noted climbs in the age based on the age although this year with a new finish at the town of Anse, which is outside of the age the riders can expect a nasty finish as well 107 miles covered on the coat to stocker sorry about a little bit of picture breaker but as you no, when you watch our tapes here on FCV, these are pictures given to us by the host television company. In this case, it's the Belgian network. And with all the trees around us here in the Belgian Ardennes, it does occasionally interfere with our picture signals down to the motorbikes. Over the top of the Côte de Soc Stocker. A little shout for Alain Stéphane. Well, that, I can tell you, is for Stephen Roach, who's up here. The man has always enjoyed Liège Baston Liège. He lost it once, though, to Moreno Argentin, the year when he should have won it, because Roche and Claude Coquillion were in the lead. The race was theirs for the taking, but they started shadow boxing, and Moreno Argentin crept up on them, didn't even look at them, jumped past them, and won the day. And that was the day that Stephen Roche really should have been able to write down on his record card victory in Liège Baston Liège. He's back there again, riding out his final season. Back with his favourite team, Carrera, with whom he won the Tour de France, Tour of Italy and World title back in 1987. This is Alex Zula. So, the heads of state have now got themselves back up to the front on this 22% downhill. And that's Miguel Indurain, just flashed through our picture as well. So he looks to me as though he's trying to prove to the world now he's coming back to his form on schedule for another crack at the Tour de France. He's done nothing this year, Miguel Indurain of note. One small win in a time trial. That's about all he can claim fame to this year. These narrow roads in the Belgian Ardennes, as we drop down now into Stablo, which is a beautiful area of, of Belgium. And when they leave Stablo, they start the climb of the Côte de haute leve And that was where Jacques Anquetil, the great Frenchman, won this race in 1966. That's where he put in the attack. It's a dead straight climb. You can almost see the top, and you grind your way steadily up it. A very difficult climb indeed. And this could be arguably the nicest town in Belgium, Stavlo. It's narrow streets, it's ancient abbey there to the right. The cobble streets are very narrow. Normally in the daytime, virtually no cars allowed into the centre, but they've closed the town down for the passage of Liège Baston Liège here. You descend into the town and you climb all of the way out of it. You can see here the lovely cobblestones that still remain as they cross the narrow streets of the centre of the town. 
spectators here now seeing the top riders coming into our picture. The pace being set by Tony Rominger. Rominger, a professional since 1986, but really, he's only shot into the top categories in the last two years. Winner of the Tour of Spain last year, and a big favorite to do well in it again this time out. A little while, they swing right down the main road, which is actually the town bypass. And then they'll start the climb of the Haute Levee. Well, I'm afraid to tell you that Jan Matthews, who is away from the seventh mile point today, has been swept away by this group of some 30 riders. Only one climb on the way down to Bastogne, the Côte de Saint Roche. That comes at 39 miles. And then when they swing around down at Bastogne, they form all, they face up all of the climbs. If you ever come over to watch uh, Liège, Bastogne Liège, by the way, with the use of a, of a car, you can watch this race probably eight or nine times before racing back to see the finishing arms. Steady progress now as the riders set their tempo. Alex Zula, he was something of a surprise in the Tour de France last year when he snatched the yellow jersey on his birthday and then withdrew on the rest day at Dole. You, but you can bet that in fact Zula will be back in the Tour this year and I'm sure won't be thinking of giving up halfway through. Possibly the man who can take on and beat Miguel Indurain and prevent that third victory for the great Spanish rider. And it looks to me as though Zula, in fact, is starting to go clear here. He's kept the rhythm up well. The Haute Leve has certainly played his part over the year. Merckx has attacked here, Oncotil has attacked here, and just look at this now. Alex Zula is starting to go clear. Enormous crowd. They've brought this very wide road down to a single lane, and Zula now turning on the style. He's got off to a great start this year, too. Alex Zula with two wins, the prologue time trial and the overall result in the Paris-Nice race, the race to the sun, which takes place in March. And then third place overall in the Criterium International, which is a two-day race, again down in the beautiful part of the south of France with its narrow roads and steep hills. And you usually find that the riders that score well in those two early season events often distinguish themselves also in the early classics. It's true to have said that of Sean Kelly and indeed of Stephen Roach in the past. Not to mention, of course, the other great names like Bernard Eno, Eric Broikink and Eddie Merckx. Now, a little group trying to scrabble up here towards Zula, who set a good pace. Unfortunately, the helicopter belies the steepness of this climb. It is a very difficult climb indeed. That looks like Tony Romiger dancing his way across the gap. Three riders forming at the front. The third rider could be Claudio Kipucci. Looks like the little hunched shoulders position of that rider. And this is Uriato, who I would presume has been caught in no man's land here as we come up towards the top of the Haute Leve. This little group trying to get up into the leading group as Jan Nevens. The unfashionable Belgium who won the stage in the Tour de France last year. And he's caught himself some hot company up here because Fondriest is there. 201 is Maurizio Fondriest, the man on form. Winner of the Flesh Will On just a couple of days ago. Zula, his clear glasses on today because I'm afraid the weather is threatening. Heavy overcast conditions, not very warm at all. Rominger on the other side. There's the lineup Rominger, Navens, Zula, and Fondriest. Well, the gauntlet's down. It's gone down very, very early on, the climb of Haute Leve. 109 miles covered. The overall distance of the race is 164 miles. And this morning, there were 186 riders on the start line. You can see the spread now. The three, four leaders setting the pace. One rider trying to breach the gap. But just look how this leading bunch has exploded on the climb of the Haute Leve. It was clear that it was here where the leaders of the teams had decided to instruct the domestiques to close down on that lone Belgian rider because everybody is afraid of the Haute Leve. It's one of the steepest climbs on the race. It's not the highest one. That's already passed by the Côte d'Ossier. That was at 67 miles, but it's certainly one of the most noted because from now on into the finish, the riders will face 
the Rossier Lorce Laredoute, the renowned Laredoute which climbs away from Remouchon and the Côte des Forges, where in years gone by anybody left in the front group has tried to split it up. Well, Jan Navens is flying the Belgian flag here today in this rather international breakaway. And the fifth rider to come on to the back of this leading group is Rolf Sorensen from the Carrera team. You may have just seen him join up there. The riders are now moving on to the next big climb in the Ardennes. This is the Côte de Lorce. And this is a long one, 4.1 kilometres officially, which makes it the longest climb of the 10. And they're dangling just ahead of the split. And you can see from our cameraman there, the rain is coming down rather heavily now. The weather changes so quickly in the Ardennes. It can be sunny on one side of these climbs. It can be pouring down the other. And it is also very cold. The arm warm was being worn there by Alex Zula, who has started this attack and seems anxious to keep it going. Rominger has been particularly frisky today, making the advantage all of the time. He came up very quickly when he saw Alex Zula break away. And he's now setting the pace on this climb. Third in the line is Claudio Kipucci, then Maurizio Fondrias, and tacked onto the back there is Jan Nevins. Well, team manager Jean-Luc Van den Broek will be rather pleased to see his lotto man has made the split for the moment at least. And there's Sorensen, who said at the start of the week he'd come into the Belgian Ardennes to win both the flesh on and the A's Bast on the A's. Well, he didn't quite make it in the flesh on, but he was up in the action all the way eventually finishing in sixth place on the Mur de, Mur de Huy, which is the big wall outside the town of the same name. Jan Navens seems to get better as he gets older. This rider now, Jan Navens, is 34 years of age. Last year won a stage of the Tour de France at Coblenz, and he was in tears when he won it there after all the years he'd been trying to take a stage. And now he's come up to this leading group very well indeed. He must be feeling a little bit overawed, I would think, by the quality of the other four men around him. From the Ardennes this morning, looking a little bit drab now. Spring is just about managing to come here because of the cold weather. They had severe thunderstorms during the flesh will on, which caused Sean Kelly to fall very heavily. Road's now extremely slippery indeed. Kierpucci again in the thick of the action, as he was in the flesh bull on a few days ago. There is, in fact, an overall prize for the champion of the Ardennes. It used to be, in fact, a weekend race, the flesh bull on and the Liège Baston Liège. Now they're spread out uh, over Wednesday through Sunday for the two events. Of course, this is the World Cup counting event, event number four, not the flesh will arm, and so this is why Gianni Bugno now riding at the front in his World Championship jersey on the right of our picture, setting a steady pace, and Piriato alongside him too. It looks as though he's been told to set the pace and try and close down on this breakaway for Bugno. Eric Broikink in the Anse colours. Well, he's not going to do any chasing while Zula sits up there. And in fact, that's, uh, that's Kia Pucci alongside him there. So that ride in the breakaway is only Sorensen. So we've got Sorensen, Rominger, Zula, Fondriest, and Navens in that breakaway. Not Kia Pucci, as I said earlier. So there's little Kia Pucci. There he is, just passing through our picture. One or two of the teammates have got up here now to try and discourage the reaction from the field. And Bunyo is realising that he was going to have to do something about this himself because nobody's going to help him. The class team have also come up. And Kierpucci won't do anything while Sorensen is up there because they're very good friends indeed. So the climb of the Lorce, keeping the riders nicely up front. Bunching. There's one or two riders want to make the pace, the rest want to slow it down, so the bunch is formed here. But the field has thinned down a lot. It regrouped after the descent from Stocker on the Haute Leve. And there you can see the size of the main field now from the big field that rolled out this morning. And maybe 35, 40 riders left in this race with any hope of catching up to those five leaders. Ciato told to make the pace, wearing his long tights this morning, and I don't blame him because life in the Ardennes can be very miserable. This race has been run off in the snow before now, the year Bernard Eno won. 
back in 1977, very few riders reached the finish in the snow. Well, this is the sort of weather that those who watch Paddy Bay like to see for the riders over the cobblestones because it always adds to the excitement. The riders don't, by the way. And it looks as though uh, Lely from Ariostia has now been told to start setting the pace. He was on the same team as Argentine, but there is Argentine now in a different team this year. And the pacemaking has taken its toll. There's a big split in that field again already as we go up towards the summit of the Côte de Lorsay. We're now deep in the heart of the Belgian Ardennes. We've climbed a long way away from Bastogne. They've made their turn down there where Jan Matthias was in the lead. He's been caught. He was caught coming out of the town of Stablo on the climb of Haute Levée. And that was where Alex Zula has decided to open up the attack. Early days to cause a panic. The riders not pushing the pace too hard. They know that they still have the climb of Ladadout to come, which is probably the most renowned, if not the hardest climb on the course, and some would say it certainly is the hardest climb, I would certainly. It's extremely steep, it's one in five over the last couple of metres as they climb up to the top of it. And if they can keep this breakaway in their sights, they should be able to move across, the strong ones at least, uh, to join them for the final climb of the day on the Côte des Forges. That's Max Chandry at the front now for Motorola. He's having a great classic season indeed. Staying all the way to the line, a challenger in the World Cup round this year. Won the second stage of the Sicilian week. But as far as the World Cup performances go, he finished fifth in the Tour of Flanders and third in Milan San Remo. That was the event this year where they had that serious crash at the finish when the organisational car was parked just after the line and the riders slammed into the back of it. A couple of spectators there, not impressed with the speed of the chasing group. Two horses running away. The Motorola riders really haven't enjoyed a good day's bast on the A's today. There's only Xiangli been up there. And you can see now the teammates of Sorensen and the teammates of Ponce of... Uh, Alex Zula, they're trying to slow down and disorganize this chase. They put Max Chiandri up there by himself to set the pace. And the gap is not very much, around about 30 seconds at the moment. They can probably see them if our camera would swing round. The pace making up the long, long climb of the Côte de Lorsay has strung this field right down the mountain. There are a lot of riders not getting back now. This looks like Stephen Hooks has come to the front. The five leaders have gone over the summit. There they are. 201 is Maurizio Fondria. Zula at the back. He's the man that started the breakaway. Jan Nathans is sitting down there in the middle. And the other two are Rominger. And the little one rather making the five leaders. A chance for a drink. But they are just dangling in front of this chase group of the, what's left of the main field, really. And I think it's more or less a chase group now. Jan Nevens, turned professional back in 1981. Didn't win too many races as a professional, but he certainly seems to have been choosing them these last few years. He won a stage of the Tour of Switzerland back in 1981, and last year, of course, he won that wonderful stage in Koblenz, where he nipped away from the leaders inside of the flag at a kilometre to go and snatched the victory in Koblenz. And he confirmed himself that year, last year as well, with third place in the Zurich Championship. But this isn't the sort of company he's used to keeping. Still left to Max Chiandri to make the pace. There's the gap now, 48 seconds. Well, it's not a lot. And there's still plenty of reaction coming from the chase group.
riders from class there trying to confuse the issue, trying to keep the riders organizing this chase. It's a tentative move that Zula's made, but quite clearly the fact that Fondrias paid such close attention to that move and then Sorensen, who came up late, also must have fancied the chance of its success. And they built this lead of 48 seconds. They still have to climb two noty climbs, which today will be included in the 10 for the King of the Mountains competition, but then the two lesser climbs, which aren't included in the Mountains competition before the finish, the new finish down at Ans. There's the breakaway in the left of our picture. And there's Sorensen sitting at the back. Zula. Zula has probably made the most dramatic rise up the world rankings this year, along with Tony Rominger. And there's Rominger now. And I must say that these Rominger keeps performing like he has. He could finish up the world number one this year. Part of the renaissance of cycling in Switzerland. Last time it was the Italians, now the pendulum is swinging towards Switzerland. It's the Belgians who are having the poor time right now, even though Johan Musea won the Tour of Flanders and is the champion of Belgium. They need a lot more successes to revitalize the interest in that country in the sport because they've never really recovered since the retirement of Eddie Merckx. The trouble was the man was simply too good. Out of the 1,800 races he rode, he won 525 of them. Now, a little reorganization. This looks like, on the left of our picture, Marino Argentin stalking the pack. Somebody else has tried to sprint off the front. And Argentin has said he wants a good ride here in Belgium this, uh, this spring because if he doesn't get it, he's talking of retiring. He's always been known as the man of the Belgian Ardennes. He's won this race four times, three times straight, 85, 86, 87. And then in 1991, while Sonson was his teammate then, he was back in third place. Now, good straight main road descent, which will please the riders because those roads are getting a little bit slippery now with the rain that's coming down. classics indeed where the Belgian riders really have dominated it. Of the 79 races we've had, the Belgians have won 60 times. But I'm afraid life in the last few years has not been quite so luxurious for Belgium. Although they won it last year with Dev de Wolf and uh, also back in 1990 with Eric van Lanka. Uh, before that you have to go back quite a way. Back into the late 70s. So the full international pressure on the race since then. But it does seem that this year the classics aren't leaving much room. It's coming down the breakaway, 39 seconds now. It does seem that the classics this year aren't leaving much room for the non-top riders, the lesser men to cause surprises. It was the case last year, we had a number of wins by rides we would never have expected, like Jackie Durand in the Tour of Flanders. But this year, the stars have made sure they haven't missed the moves. And this is a very talented breakaway. The only rider really that we would not expect to be here is Jan Nevens. And no sign at all of this weather now, Beijing. It's closed in slowly on us ever since we made the turn down at Bastogne. You can see the spray coming up onto the camera lens here from the back wheel the rider in front. And that's a breakaway that's gone clear of the field, I think. And it looks like, I'm not sure, I think it was Miguel Indurain who has gone clear of the field. And yes, it is. This is Indurain here on the right. And so they've only just gone clear, and they've gone clear going down. Udo Boltz is the other rider from Germany, rides for the German Telecom team. Now they've gone clear, strangely enough, not on a climb, 
but on the descent, taking advantage of the dangerous conditions. And Miguel Indurain has jumped the back of Udo Bolts here, and they're willing to work together. So they're taking risks now. Indurain quite clearly feels that that breakaway is the winning break of the day, and the only way to win this race now is to get across to it. Well, it's good to see Miguel in our camera lens. We haven't seen too much of him this year. That's a rather traditional opening for him. 45 kilometers to go, that's 28 miles. And Injure now trying to get across this gap as quickly as possible because he knows that the showdown on Laradut is coming. Into the town of Aiwai, where the riders will turn right in the main part of the town and gradually head out towards the next town of Remuchon, where they'll turn left over the river bridge there and they'll climb up the ladder to climb. Well, this great classic began back in 1892, one for the first three years by a Belgian rider, Leon Hua. Well, there's so many races where there weren't, there wasn't too much foreign opposition in the early years of the classics. Once the other riders came in, then the the wind pattern did change somewhat. Fondrias trying to keep this pace alive. Zula, who started it all, probably wishing he didn't right now, I think, because the weather's gone so bad and they're not going away from the groups at all. There's a huge crowd waiting on the top of Lavadut for the riders. And the gap is closing down. 34 seconds in Juana Bolts and a little bit further back to what is left of the main field. And that bunch, we understand, is around about 21 riders, 21, 22 riders. It's a very brave move by Miguel in Duran. Like Claudio Chiapucci, married during the off-season, and of course all the accusations follow that married life doesn't suit the hungry ways of a top professional bike rider. Form hasn't been coming as quickly as at least the Italian Spanish journalists would like to see, and the Italian journalists in the case of Chiapucci. They want some confirmation that their two stars will be ready for the upcoming Tour de France, and perhaps in the case of Chiapucci, a win at last, who knows? Certainly, the route for the Tour de France this year is a vicious one. Udo Boltz, strong German rider, lands the occasional big win in the small stage races, but he's never won a classic. And he's having a job hanging on to the descending here of Indurain, who's coming down this hill at something like 45, 50 miles an hour. This big man, who says his resting heartbeat is 28, Now the unpleasant bit, when you have to ride behind a rider with all the spray coming straight at you. The gap is continuing to fall. This is a true, superb chase by Indurain. If he continues like this, scheduled arrival with the front group should be around the base of Latitude. And whether he'll have the legs left to master any attacks that might come up there, we'll only have to wait and see. There's Rominger. Very long reach on Tony Rominger. Maurizio Fondrias said he's never been as happy as he is right now. He's just the proud father of the first child. He's moved back this year to an Italian team, and Italians love to be in Italy. They don't really take to the life away from their own country. And now everything's going right for him. He's winning races, he's leading the World Cup. In fact, this year already, he's had seven victories, including the Milan San Remo, which is the great star for an Italian to win the first Classic of the Year in Italy. And then he also won before that Terreno Adriatico, the small stage race that always runs concurrently with Paris-Nice. Which always upsets the organizers of Paris-Nice because they would love the Italians to go across the borders there. Lost his lead overall in the World Cup at paris Bay, where he didn't ride. But he's warned us all that he's fit and ready to go and regain that lead in the World Cup competition because he won the flesh will on in dominating style recently. Four days ago, he broke away on the last big circuit. They couldn't catch him, they could see him and couldn't reach him. And he stormed up to the climb of the Muerte de Hui, kept it going all the way up. 
and one clearly. This is Hawaii. And there is Jan Nevis. Which is exciting, the Belgian commentators, I can tell you that, not surprisingly, because if Nevis hadn't read this move, there wouldn't have been a Belgian up here today. Now, I know that many of you like to come over to Europe and watch the classic races, but if you do want to ever bring your bikes, I can tell you the Belgian Ardennes is a superb area for cycling. And while we watch the faces here of the leaders of the chases of Udo Boltz and Miguel Ingerain, touring-wise, if you base yourself in Remouchon or Hawaii, where they are now, there's many narrow little roads, but you can't take Liège-Baston-Liège up because the roads are too narrow but they're a lot steeper than the ones the riders cross and the scenery is stunning. 26 seconds, so they're coming down. Indurain and Boats look as though they might well bridge over the gap. 48 seconds back to the chase group. They really are not out of contention at all because Roach is in that group, so too Broiking, although they won't do the counter-attack because they're keeping well con under control uh, Gianni Bugno, the world champion in that back group. Johan Museo is also in there, champion of Belgium. He would like to be over here because the MG team from Italy have dominated the opening classics of the year in many ways. But they haven't got a man in this league group today. And Ballerini is also in that chase group. So the, the MG team and the team losing out. Well, even under pressure, Indurain still looks immaculate and relaxed in the slipstream there of Udo Boltz. Jan Nevens looks to see who's coming up. The riders get a bit twitchy when cars pass them because it often means that the race referees have told the cars to go ahead because the chase group is catching them up. And you see the loss of the neutral service vehicle there, the Mavic yellow car, indicates that this breakaway now is well within reach of Miguel Indurain. They've taken out all of the vehicles. They do this to try and keep the race very fair indeed because chasing riders will spot those lead cars and will go for the cars rather than the riders. So by clearing the gap, very often it has the adverse effect on the chasers and they can't get across. It's a cruel world. But the riders also know now that if they don't keep the pressure on, this attack is going to fail. And this went, don't forget, on the Haute Leve after 109 miles. We're approaching the 136 mile point here. Long legs of Zula turning out to be the next big star of world cycling, I'm sure of that. 38 kilometers to go, that's 24 miles. But what are 24 miles? I guarantee that uh, if a touring cyclist was trying to ride that 38 kilometers a day, he could reckon on an hour and 45 minutes. Well, I think these riders will be there in just on the hour, hour five. There's the little group that set the trend ever since they passed the unfortunate Jan Matthews from La William. A team which has also announced its withdrawal from the sport next year, which is rather sad, and another body blow to Belgium. While the rest of the world seems to be on a high in the sport, Belgium is taking one or two unfortunate knocks. Boats trying to keep on to the wheel there of Miguel Indurain. This is Remouchon, now the left turn. They run a criterium around here as well, down this very road we're on now, which will shortly turn to cobblestones. And they'll make a right and they make a very sinuous approach to the start of Ladadoupe, which is a very good road indeed, but very, very steep. 42-24, the sort of gearing the riders will carry for this climb. When I climbed it, I did 42-26. <laughs> 18 seconds, so they're closing all the time, but they're not going to get on, you know, in time for the climb, which is unfortunate, because you need a few seconds to get your second wind and recuperate before you hit Ladadoot. There's the leading group. They're in the same lane as the two chasers. Sharp left-hand bend here. And very gently taken as well. Then they'll make a right. And then they will climb parallel with the main Liège auto route, which runs on the right shoulder. And this road climbs way above that. There's the graphics. 9.8% is the average gradient. 20% right. Oh, and Bolts has gone down. That's Bolts come off that bend, and he's hit the traffic sign. So Indurain, I presume, has gone through. Oh, has he gone through? He's gone well through. Indurain has gone. 
Well, perhaps our director will show us that again in slow motion a few minutes' time because we'll have a camera right with them. But Indrain, really, that's a shame because he needed the firepower of Udo Bolts. Now he's on his own. Here we go. What's the back ride? What's the front rider? Bolts, oh dear me, and Indrain was lucky. He managed to get his front brake on just enough to get him round the fallen Udo Bolts. But by the time Bolts is up and sorted out, that chase group will be on him. The gap isn't large enough. That's left Indrain on his own now. And there he is, on the lower slopes of Laradut. Miguel Indurain is now in a little bit of trouble. He could do with those relays. Well, at rest, his heartbeat is said to be 28, and it reaches a full firepower at 150. And I would think he's probably beating at 200 after seeing the crash right in front of him there of Udo Bolts. He was very lucky to escape it. Now, let's go further up the slopes of Laradut. Here's Zula. Zula's in trouble. Now, that's, that surprised me. Alex Zula, who started this attack on Haute Leve, is now having to hang on. This is not the steepest part of the climb. Just when you think it's all going to be nice, you go around the corner and you'll see the crowd standing a long way above your head. It gets quite steep. Rominger relaxed and climbing very well indeed. What a brilliant climber he is. There's Jan Nevin, surprisingly inspired by the fact he's racing on roads he knows inside out. And there's confirmation that Zula has been dropped from this league group, so we've got four riders left up front. And it's all under the steady impetus here of Tony Rominger. Rolf Sorensen looking okay. He's been up here in the league group before, alongside his teammate Moreno Argentin. Fondria sitting at the back there, doesn't look too uncomfortable. And the vehicles on the right there are parked actually on a freeway. But I don't suppose anybody will mind. This is Belgium after all, and we'll climb above the level of the freeway as the riders continue. That looked like uh, Cassani. Oh, it's just gone slip through our picture there. And this is the chase group trying desperately to reorganize something. There's a little bit of the crowd. All lining up on the right-hand side of the road because they get the advantage of the bend to see further down the climb. And this is the narrow bit now where it really goes up to that 20% gradient. Rominger content to set the pace. Fondrius content to just stay at the back here. And as this crowd closes in, there's not going to be much chance to pass anyway. And Miguel Indurain, we understand, is falling further back. So he was unlucky. He put everything into bridging that gap before the climb of Laladute. It's failed. And these uh, four leaders now winding up towards the top. That's Lely, in fact, on the left of our picture here. Kiapucci gritting his teeth, hanging on to Lely's wheel. Kiapucci would love to be up in this leading group, but he's handicapped by the fact that his teammate Sorensen's here, so he can't come up on his own. He'd be accused of bringing the rest up, because it's such a tentative lead by these four riders, it really has never gone clear. They've barely scraped a minute's lead at any point. They're just heading up towards what really is a false flat as they come over the top, and then it will kick again just by the line. And you see the Belgians, they always said they used to be biased for Belgium, but believe me, they will support anybody who's putting in maximum effort in one of their classic races. They were marvellous to Fondry Estien Fleshville on the other day. They shouted into his ear all the way up the finishing climb of the Mwer de Puy. Rominger has set the pace wonderfully up this climb. I don't think he's ever got out of... Oh, just to make me wrong, he's just got out of the saddle. A sign of a pure climber. He's also a very good time trial rider. Has all the abilities for winning big tours. He proved that last year when he won the Tour of Spain. He's never ridden well in the Tour de France. Let's hope he comes this year to the Tour de France because he really could be a man to take the mantle away from Miguel Indurain. And this is the chase group. So, you see, 
Claudio Kikuchi will not help out at all here, Lielli. And sitting behind him all the way up, and that chase group is going to pull them back, I think. Once over the top, it stays very narrow roads and have a sharp descent. As we go down through the town of Spremont, that becomes a much nicer road. Then we head up towards the Côte des Forges. Kierpucci has had steady form all season. No victories, but I think he has a reputation now like the great Frenchman, the former rider, Raymond Poulidor, who was always second and never won, and I think Kipuchi seems to be one of those riders. Heading up now towards the finish of Laladut, and they'll be glad this one is behind them. They'll now reassess the whole thing as they go over the top, and they make a right turn. Jan Nadens may be overall by the company here, but he's riding a very clever race as well. He's just watching the riders tick through. He's not taking part in the mountains competition. And he's probably extremely nervous because he's carrying the whole weight of Belgium now to try and get a home victory. And he has just about three of the most on-form riders in the world right now sitting right in front of his wheel. Sorensen, Fondriest, and at the front there, Tony Rominger. And it looks as though they either allowed Rominger to take the flag because he made the pace all the way up, or there was nothing they could do about it. But he's still in the lead. This will be where we're coming up towards the right-hand bend. Now, for those of you who bought our Motorola tape a while back, you may remember I was rather out of breath on that tape at this corner. This is where we made the right-hand bend with the Motorola team the day before Liège, Baston Liège. They're saying 20 seconds is the gap, in fact, back to those two chasers. That's nothing. They settle down, but remember that Kipuchi will not help. And as we watch the four leaders here, heading now down towards Spremont, Indurain has been dropped by that chase group, so he really did give his all on that climb to get to the climb. He failed to get across in time to recover, and he's paid the price on the steep slopes of Laladute. Apparently, the whole field have passed him by. Now, Fondrius knows that once you're over Laladute, it's go for home as best you can. So often being the case here, where Moreno Argentine has been in complete control, of Liège Bast on Liège, but this year he's not up here at all. He's going to be very disappointed about that. And that's Eric Broekink who's coming through. So Brookink is starting to get across the gap now. So we're forming a powerful chase group. But don't forget, Brookink will not. Well, he will now, of course, because we've dropped Zula. He will have noted Zula go past him on the climb of Laradut. So the pressure is now swung back to the Onse team, to Brookink, to try and pull back these four leaders. So from blocking one minute, He's now got to attack and try and bring them back. He's got up to Claudio Chiapucci. Giorgio Ferland with Chiapucci, not Lely. Ferland, what an underrated rider he is, always in at the result of a big classic race. And that's Argentine gone through with the glasses on. Argentine has come from absolutely nowhere. He's come climbing steadily up with his group, which seems to be about 10 or 12 long. So they've chased Broekink, who came up first. Argentine is now up there. This is a superb group, group now that can settle down. And Cassani is also here, David Cassani. Ballerini is the rider on the left of our picture, so the MG team have got their man up here. Ballerini still embarrassed by the way he lost Harry Roubaix the other week. And he should have won it, of course. He came onto the stadium with Gilbert Duclos Lazal. And you could tell them which one was the track rider and which one wasn't. Duclos Lazal won by the width of his tire. So Ballerini would like to make amends today. We have never lived down Paddy Roubaix. And there's the composition. Berlan, Cassani, Kipucci, Scandri, Ballerini, Eddie Bowmans is here. Eric Broikink and Marino Argentin. They're the leaders. Well, they're not the leaders, but they're the chasers, and it's a very select group indeed. And again, we're seeing another classic this year where only the best names have survived. No newcomers, no luck, 
and nobody springing a surprise, with the exception perhaps of young Navens, who's using his experience of being a professional since 1981. Now we're out on the narrow road for a while at least. We're heading now down towards Spremont. These four riders, and earlier with the help of Alex Zula, have dangled like a carrot in front of that group. They've never been cleared the field, and they still may not stay away, because there are now a lot of rides with no teammates up here to defend for. They could well apply the pressure. The MG team are certainly going to want to put the pressure on. The Ariostia will want to put the pressure on. So too will Argentine. Quite a tricky descent in the wet list, and have a sharp right hand bend, surely. And as you can see, the roads are rather slippery. They had to take out, in fact, two of the climbs before the start today at the uh, Cote de Wan and the Cote de Ezal early on. But they replaced them with two others almost as steep, so the riders saved nothing. They put in two new ones, the Deremont and the Desamont. They were, in fact, before we picked up Jan Matthias. little pan round 26 seconds absolutely nothing at all 26 seconds now and that group is reorganizing itself behind Injuane has gone straight through that group he's now way behind apparently and uh, Jean-Francois Bernard has come up as well the French rider that's on the Bonesto team they picked up all of the riders who were chasing Kipuchi and Ferland David Cassani gone through there. And again, that feel under pressure. Well, you can't tell it from the helicopter. In fact, they are racing down quite a good hill here. That's why they've got the big gaps between the wheels. One or two riders clearly nervous, they're laying off rather a long way. They'll shortly be starting their ascent of the Côte des Forges. That's where Pedro Delgado once made his move for victory, but Sean Kelly was far too vigilant for that, caught him and went on to win. And that tells us that Eric Broiking has punted from this chase group. Well, it's not the Anse day, is it? Zula makes the opening attack. Zula gets dropped and ladder dude. Broiking in with a real chance of crossing now to the leaders has gone out of the race with a puncture. Well, that's bad luck for Eric Broiking. Really nice guy. His father, Vin, used to be the top man in the Gazella Cycle Factory before his retirement. Now Vin tells me, or Eric tells me rather, that his dad plays a lot of golf. Max Chiandri, the only motor roller left in at the front. It hasn't been their day either, but Chiandri has still kept this tremendous form this year for the early season classics. Surely it's not going to be long before he lands a big one for his team. Sani, Chiandri, Giapucci, they're the three pacemakers. Argentine is the rider I would be very concerned about. Ferlan, Cassani is the back. It's Ferlan again who's setting the pace for Ariostia. Two former teammates of Argentine, so he knows their moves and their tactics inside out. He knows what they will do. He knows their strengths as well. Kipuchi keeping a nice eye on everybody, but doesn't want to help out, of course, because he still has Rolf Sorensen up there. This is a climb, by the way, away from the town of Spremont, which is never part of the... 10 mountains but believe me it is a terribly difficult climb and it is where in fact Argentine had to hold on to the breakaway a couple of years ago and make sure he kept them under control before he went on to win the race Ballerini sitting at the back but surprisingly that group does not seem to be spinning up Kiafucci is keeping them nicely under control there's the three or four leaders now let's pull back with the helicopter and there's the chasers that's how close they are absolutely nothing in it you know Still a long way to go, not in terms of kilometers, but in terms of the terrain that still lies ahead. And there's the main 
field as we go back down to the ground level on our motorbikes. I always admire the motorcyclists on weather like this because they take the same risks as the cyclists. And despite the fact that the motorcyclists may be crashing, you'll always see our cameraman keep his focus on the riders. Now, new legs for Jan Navens, realizing that once you over Laredoux, there's a real chance now that this breakaway can succeed. And Navens knows if he doesn't, he's not going to be going anywhere if they get caught. He's got to keep this breakaway, willing to work now. Rominger, Sorensen, Fondriest. Fondrias hasn't overworked in this breakaway. He's done his share, but he hasn't overworked. The man has put his real back into it is Tony Rominger. And he hasn't gone anywhere. It's hovering for the last 20, 30 miles at around 25 to 45 seconds. And yet the chase groups can't get across. And that's got to be down to the annoying, hindering tactics by riders like Kifuchi. have had to stay friends, although they represent, of course, rival teams. They've had to work together. They've had no time really to think about tactics of how they're going to win this race from this group, because their only concern has been to stay away from the chase. And Sorensen is still concerned as to their whereabouts. In fact, it seems to have dropped off further. And this is a Moreno Argentine. Argentine looking very, very concerned, but equally relaxed. Big man, no success in the age, Baston on the age, 85, 86, 87, and 1991. He's become a cult hero here in Belgium. Somehow everybody expects him to do something, and you know he still can, because this gap is only a few seconds, and a good effort would see him over here. Chandry also has worked well. There's Argentine. Rider well known to the Americans because he won his road racing title in Colorado back in 1986. Same year, of course, he'd won the age Baston the age that year earlier. And he put up a fine defense of his world title in 1987 in Austria when he finished second to the fast finishing Stephen Roach. But he really is a man for these two Ardennes classics. Second in Flesh Wallon in 1988. He won Flesh Wallon also in 1990. And he's got those four race, four race victories in this particular event. But the form has not been there this year yet, and Argentina has hinted if he doesn't find it soon, he's going to stop cycling altogether. Well, I think he'd be pleased with the way it's going so far. He's into this final selection from the chase group and they would all like to bridge the gap to this group who are giving nothing away. We're heading off towards the Cote de Forge now. Chianri, Ballerini, Bowmans, they're all back there in that chase group. All well capable of bridging the gap if these riders make a single mistake and I wonder just how, for example, Jan Navens is feeling right now. Surprisingly, it was Zula who cracked first. He's gone on Laradoux, gone right through the groups as well. There's the eight chasers, 34 seconds. They just can't get any closer, can they? You can almost touch these leaders and can't reach them. happy with the situation. He's pinning all his faith on Rolf Sorensen. There's Ballerini, who has nobody up front and really shouldn't be sitting around at the back unless he is planning an attack on the Cote de Forge, which wouldn't surprise me. It's the last serious climb. He's still 15 miles from the finish. Still time to bridge 30 odd seconds. Plenty of time. People who race in Belgium all the season round call this typically Belgian weather. It doesn't always rain in Belgium, but it does seem to provide us with the best bike racing. Here's the situation with Le Forge, the Cote de Forge, 13% at its steepest point, an overall average gradient of 4.8%. And this climb lasts for two kilometers, or that's just over a mile.
lovely crowd watching the leaders and I'm not surprised they're taking it very carefully around that corner now they start the climb of the Cote Bush Cote de Forge is a climber which is also used on the flesh full on, but it comes very early in the race and plays no part in shaping it as a rule. It's um, only a few kilometres down the road from the start and the spa. But it's become the key factor. Very often, in the A's bast on the A's. Nevins looks around, he's hearing all the shouts now out of this crowd up for him. Because you have the lovely choice in Belgium. There's the main hairpin bend for the chase group, which is swollen somewhat. In fact, I think that's probably the third group on the road now. Unless they've been strengthened by a large group which has joined on. The people here, not only will they be zigzagging around looking at the race five, six, seven, or even eight times, they'll also be popping in out of cafe doorways and keeping in touch with it on television too. As Jean-Francois Bernard, who's now turning the screw a little bit tighter as we start the climb. I think a museum is also there. Well, they know this is the last chance they've got. Jean-Francois Bernard, who hoped his team leader, Miguel Indurain, would have crossed the gap before Remachon, saw him fail and passed him struggling on Laradute. Now it's up to the Frenchman to try and put matters right. that little man, that wonderful little man from Carrera, Claudio Kipucci, seen the attack, has moved up into second place to discourage anybody else sharing the pacemaking with Bernard. And I'm sure Rolf Sorensen will appreciate that. He is uh, an extremely good domestic who has the pedigree of a race winner, Claudio Kipucci, never afraid all upset when it's called upon him to be second string. Pondria setting the pace, bit further up the slopes now, on the 12% section here. Sorensen looks good, so too does Rominger, again sitting there, setting a rhythm. And Jan Navens hangs on the back. Well, all the cars are back in position, so that means we've probably got around 38 seconds. Sorensen setting the steady tempo. No Danish rider has ever won the A's Bast on the A's. In fact, I can quickly give you a rundown on the countries you have. Belgium with 60 victories. Italy with six victories. France have got five. Switzerland, three. Germany and Holland and Ireland have two each. And Luxembourg has one. That's the basic statistics. And the record man is, of course, Eddie Merckx, who won the race in 69, 71, 2 and 3, and finally in 1975. And that's David Cassani who's gone from the front of the group. And again, Claudio is going to annoy him. Nothing left in the legs there of Jean-Francois Bernard. Eddie Bowman's also. I'm going to sit there and watch. Cote de Forge is a main road climb, but it is very steep towards the end. Cassani, shadow by Kipuchi. I often wonder if, in fact, kipuchi has got the lead now, but he's not really chasing down. He's trying to alter the rhythm of Cassani. He's not going to want to pull anybody up there. David Cassani could win this race, most certainly, if he was taken across to that lead group. There's Kipuchi back in number two slot. Lovely crowd on the top here at the Cote de Fourche. Claudio Kipuchi between... 1985 and 1988, his first three, first three years as a professional, never won a race. In 1989, he picked up two wins, finished 46 in the Tour of Italy, 81st in the Tour de France. And then, of course, we all know after that, he took the yellow jersey in the Tour in 1990. That was when Greg Lamond asked who he was, virtually. And he finally finished second overall in the Tour de France. And we all knew who he was. He's become a great star since then. Now he's a little bit exasperated, I think. He would love to do something about that breakaway, but on the other hand, he'll feel content. Sorensen knows the finish. Well, no, let's be fair, he doesn't actually know the new finish at Ange. He knows the sort of run. We go across 
the city of Liège, but we continue on this time and climb the Côte des Ans, which is a nasty little hill. A kilometre or so it finishes before we get to the line in the town of Ans. Ballerini's making his move, and again it's Kipucci who's gone for him. Where does he find these legs? Ballerini's put his move in on the Côte des Fours. This is where we would expect him to make his final effort, but Ballerini has been shadowed by Kiapucci, and this is again Jean-Francois Bernard gets across as well. And that will be a Ferland, who's up there too. Four riders split clear. Temporarily lost sight too of Moreno Argentine. He doesn't seem to have taken part in his skirmishes on the Cote de Forge. That's Ballerini, Chiapucci, two Italians on rival teams. Ballerini had a great year a couple of years ago. He's got the form back again this time. But sadly for him, he lost Paris Nice and he was the one that made the mistake. Back with the leaders. This group never out of sight of that chase group, and yet they don't show any signs of panic. But they know they must keep the pressure on to the limit. There's no time to finesse or try and dip out of the work rate. Ballerini, surely the man who should be across there. Seventh in Milan San Remo this year, sixth in the Tour de Flanders, second by a whisker in Paris Roubaix. Well in touch with the World Cup leadership board. And the gap is down to 17 seconds now. Laurent Jalabert is up to this group now. The riders keep popping up from the back all the time. What a great race this is to Gertjan Ternisse now. He's come up as well. A lot of new strength come up here now that could drive this break along. And that looks like Dufault was also here. off to those four riders in the lead because you can see how quickly this chase group is going and yet those four riders have not hesitated they've not panicked they've hardly ever looked over their shoulders and they're hanging on to the age bast on the age by the skin of the racing tires they broke away at uh, approximately 109 miles with that attack of Alex Zula on the climb of the Haute Leve out of Stockholm Now they're heading towards the city of Liège. But unfortunately, it's not the finish today. They've got to go across the city. Still panic there. Now, Andreas is seriously checking out that chase behind. Rominger doesn't dare look back. And you can hear the riders shouting as well as the, the public here now. They're trying to drive this break along. They know if they're caught, they haven't got a chance. They've given out all of their energy to stay clear. Sorensen also shouting, once more action. And I think they're shouting at Jan Navens, who is uh, starting to miss turns. Not very far behind this chase group. Furlong is the rider up there with Kipuchi as ever. Ballerini. And Ballerini would like some assistance. It's very frustrating, but he's still trying to get across that gap. And again, this group has split. There's a number of riders who don't want to work, there are others who do want to work, there's some that can't work. And the result at the moment is this is a very, very fragmented chase group. Look at the gaps between the wheels. It's not organized at all at the moment. And as they slow down, there's a general reforming here by riders coming back into the fray. Sadly, Eric Broeking does not recover from that puncture, is not back up here. working breakaway. Moto 1 always indicates we're with the leaders. Sorensen, whose father Jens was on the Danish 
Olympic team a few years ago and always watches our coverage in the English language too. Very nice man indeed, very proud of what his son Rolf has done and I should imagine today he's pretty excited as well. This is Cassani who's gone. David Cassani, a very dangerous man indeed for the Ariostea team. But realizing it's it's just not working, Ballerini is the first up to him. And Johan Muzu. The chase continues to try and reorganize itself. Cassani captured there, sitting at the back. This continual looking around by the riders indicates that there's so many in this group does not want to assist. Just about 10 miles left from the finish. There's Johan Muzu looking over his shoulder. He'd desperately like to get up there with Ballerini. Muzu would finish it off nicely in the sprint if he could get there, but he can't get there. Winner of the Tour of Flanders gave Belgium a proud moment this year, wearing the colours of the national championship, which he's got covered over today because it's so cold. I think he's put an extra jersey on during the ride. There's the composition of this chase group. Number 75 is Luke Rusen. And again, the group has thinned out dramatically in the chase. Passengers and aggressors alike. question is, can those four riders still hang on as they are, go across the town or the city of Liège because they will cross the river Mars. It's Mars in the Dutch language, it's the Meuse in the French language, but it's the same river. And the sight of Liège might well inspire the final closing down of this chase, which has gone on now since the 107 mile point and we're at about the 153 mile point covered. Long descent, running in out of the Ardennes, down to the valleys and into Liège. Well, there have been some great races in the Liège, Bastogne Liège over the years, but this is going to go down as one of the finest by a breakaway of stars who never quite escaped and still haven't. The gap has opened slightly to 32 seconds. I wouldn't call it comfortable though. The time slowly running out for the chasing group. Although apart from Kipuchi now, it does seem that this group is being formed of riders who would like to be up in that leading group. Fondrest. Naven's taking the race through now. So he's back into the fray with the four up riders here. Tony Rominger. the exception of Jan Navens, all of these riders are classic winners. Rominger became a classic winner back in 1989 when he won the Tour of Lombardy, which he's done again, of course, he did this in 1992 as well, to end the season. So they're no strangers to the big victories, and they also know what it's like to dangle out in front of the best bike riders in the world. Again, strong men splitting the chase up, but getting nowhere. Now, Stephen Roach we've seen there, so he's made his way up now, riding his last season. Always come good in Liège, Baston Liège. Rather a shame he's never actually won the race, but he's always been up there. That's Giorgio Ferland, gone through the picture. And there's Stephen, there's Cassani on his wheel. And Stephen, of course, is not going to chase through. <laughs> Little bit of frustration. But you know, um, Roach is certainly not going to help bring back his teammate, Rolf Sorensen. I spoke to Stephen Roach before the start of Flesh Well On, and he was saying that Rolf Sorensen was riding like two men in the Tour of the Pays Basque, absolutely flying. 
And he said to me, he said he won't win the flesh will on, but he will win Liège Baston Liège. Well, we'll find out. He was right about the first thing. He didn't win flesh will on, but he was in the result. He finished sixth. Now to one of our breathtaking descents here with our cameraman right up with the leaders. Still, riders trying to work this chase out. But 13 kilometres to go from the finish now at Chenet. Seven miles. About two and a half of those miles are uphill. With the last climb, approximately just over a mile, mile and a quarter. Steep climb that brings them up towards the finish at Anse. But so often this Liège Baston Liège has come down towards the finish in a big bunch with just a couple of riders off the front. Today they've been spread right across the, the Ardennes. And it's all because the big stars attack so far out today at 107 miles. And that is why these riders have scrabbled to try and put right the mistake they made. Individually they've tried to cross the gap, they've been brought back. And these four riders have been simply magnificent. In particular, Rominger, very, very strong on the mountains. Fondrius has ridden a very sly race. He's worked, but never overworked. He's looking for the win. And Jan Levin's working hard now, because the thought of what he's doing is on Belgian television, and he's doing his reputation no harm at all. 37 seconds, they're not, they're just stuck. It was 38 last time, they're just one on one, and nobody is getting anywhere now. They're both riding at precisely the same speed. This is amazing. There's the Mars on our left as they run over there. We'll turn across the river as we go into Liège. In fact, the riders go very close to the hotel they stay in, which I would think is uh, a little bit upsetting, especially if you're suffering at the back of this race today. And this great city now ready to welcome the 79th Liège, Baston Liège, once again. It's an area where there are many cycle races throughout the year. There's amateur races as well as professional races. But this is the classic that everybody knows. The World Championships have been held down here because there is a track not too far away at Rocour. And that group again has swollen up to about 20 riders or so. Strange and curious race pattern today. Nobody can break the lead of these riders. Look, Rolf Sorensen now, he's been in this position before, 11 kilometers to the finish, six and a half miles or so to go. He was here once before when he was alongside his teammate, Moreno Argentin. They're now both changing teams this last winter and they're both on rival squads now. And oh, we're checking the mileage to go. Maybe the heartbeat as well. I would think it's beating quite well now, Tony. And if it comes down to the sprint, Fondrius will be fancied well. They're still driving to the maximum. There's no chance to ease off, no chance to plan a move at all. They've got to keep themselves right down on the bike. Race director's car riding alongside there. This race now organized by the same organization as Paris-Roubaix, which is the Société du Tour de France, which is the organization, of course, which puts on the big race itself. And what a great job they do. They help out the local club here, the Paison Club de Liégeoise, who have promoted this race since they decided on the idea back in 1892. echelon formed at last, indicating the wind is coming from about 5 to 12 on our windscreen, uh, television screen. Everybody trying to duck in behind. This is Gerard Rouet, who rode extremely well in flesh on to get second place for the second year running. Turnicer is up here. Now, perhaps this little group can do something about it, because they seem 
to have shed the rest of the chase group on the flat road. They were all together a minute ago. They've got something going there now. We're in the streets of Liège. Over the bridge of the river Merza. And they must be gaining in confidence, but there's no real chance for them to get confident because they can't even afford to ease up just to take a drink right now. Nice view of the river. Oh, well, there we are. Jan Evans has found the time to take a drink and the souvenir for somebody as well. Turney says, flowing locks. They used to call him Geronimo because of his hairstyle. He looked a little bit like an Apache. And that looks to me as though Kipuchi has gone away again. And now invited people to join him. They're making the left turn. That's how close it is. We're just over the same bridge now where Jan Nevens has thrown away his drinking bottle. As we move on. Heading now towards Anse. And it's a minute one. Well, it's extended. I'm surprised at that. But it's somebody has hesitated back in that field. It's gone out to what is now a comfortable one minute, one second. The riders probably don't know that. But that surely is enough. A breakaway that's never been away at all. It's Dangle has now got one minute on the field. Now, if the, if the commissaires on the motorbikes come and tell the riders this, then I think we will begin to see the tactics change at the front. Over the river, there's the main pack again in the age, Bastion the age, with just five miles to go. There seems to be nobody missing their turn in this league group. Four committed men. And Jan Navens, well, I'd be delighted if Jan Navens won this race. He deserves it today. He is, and I'm sure he would admit it, uh, not in the same category as the other three riders as far as results go. But he has been throwing in the odd great one. Stage winner in the Tour of Switzerland, there he is. Stage winner in the Tour de France. Finished fourth in the Tour of Luxembourg. We're going back a little bit there to 1989. Only won one race in his first four years as a professional. Mind you, there are many professionals who don't win any. We only ever seem to talk about the stars, don't we, on world television. But there are many riders who participate to make these riders just look as great as they really are. The Spanish flag flying there, well, they're going to have to uh, support the Swiss rider, Tony Rominger, who races on the Spanish team. Because Indurain didn't make the cut in the end. In fact, Indurain is reported to be some way behind now. There's Rominger. And here's the chase down. Looks like Dufo is trying to get some reaction for the Ante team because they've had a rather quiet spell and they've had a lot of bad luck today too. Well, very shortly now we'll be seeing the final obstacle of Liège Baston Liège, which is the new hill, the Côte de Danse. They say it's long and steep. And I wonder if it will mean a split in this leading group. Romig is the obvious choice. He climbs so well. Fondrius has the all-round ability. I don't think Fondrius could ever possibly win the Tour de France, but he could certainly win the age based on the age. Romiger. Sitting at the back now, perhaps thinking what he can do with this climb that's coming up. Minute four, they're still going clear. I would think they've gone through the psychological mark with that chase group, who now have conceded they can't bring him back, bring these four riders back. And uh, Sorensen, particularly Sorensen, has a lot of thanking to give Claudio Kipucci there, who's always been the man to spoil the chases. Because there were so many riders in that chase group. And this is Argentina who's gone clear. Ar on his own, as I speak, Argentina has gone away. And this is a last chance for the champion of the Flanders races, of the Ardennes races rather, Moreno Argentin. He's won this race four times, and this is his final swan song. He's got to get across and get across quickly. He looks over, he's on his own, there's nobody coming up behind him. 
Moreno Argentin is clear, he's gambled, and I, I wouldn't surprise me, in fact, if Moreno has not been out uh, yesterday to have a look at the finishing hill here, and now he will know if there's a chance to jump across on it. There's his four victories listed there, six in 1990 as well as 12th in 1988. Tremendous record. And I'm sure he's been out to have a look at the finish before he rode today. A little bit of a tricky right-hander on the cobblestones. And now they're going to start the climb up towards the finishing line, but it's a little bit over the top as well. Jan Naven sitting slightly off the back there. I wonder if they know that Manuel Argentin is now trying to bridge the gap by himself and believed to be closing in. Seven kilometers to go, about four and a half miles to the finish. Maybe slightly less. Manuel Argentin left to set the pace. Rominger on his shoulder. He does see that Tony Rominger has assessed that Argentin is the rider he must keep the biggest eye on. Sorensen. Beautifully strong rider, came out of the Tour de France a couple of years ago when he was wearing the race leader's yellow jersey. <laughs> Sorensen who broke his collarbone on the stage went into Valenciennes. For those of you who like facts, when he retired from the Tour de France, wearing the leader's yellow jersey, he became only the tenth man in the history of the tour to leave by what the French call the little door while leading the race. Now, what's going on? Uh, Jan Neyman is, is going to make sure that nobody gets behind him on this climb. He's blaming Sorensen, I think, for opening the gap. But Sorensen wants to know where everybody is. And now the falling out is starting. And you know, Argentin is closing this gap. It's a pity our cameras haven't swung back. Jean-Luc Jean Vandenbroek here is telling him four kilometers to go, I think. And he will also be telling him, because they will know from the car radios, that Argentine, and here he is, is coming up. Moreno Argentin, the champion of the Ardennes, is making his move. Has he left it too late? Sorensen, who I don't think understands Flemish, went back and had a little earwigging there too. We're between Jean-Luc Van der Broek, former great cyclist himself, is now the manager of Jan Navens and his lotto team. And there in the distance, you can just about see the tail of the vehicle. So I'll put this gap down to about 35, 40 seconds now at the most. Argentin may have left it too late, but he's got to have a go for it. He's got the advantage of knowing it's not a straight run in. There is the hill to come. And surely those four are tired now. And it could be that the change of course is turning out to be a great success from the organizational viewpoint because it is giving us a nail-biting finish to the 79th of the age passed on the age. These four riders deserve the top four places, there's no question about that, because they attacked on the haute leve, they gambled on a long ride to the finish, and it has been a gamble all the way. They have never had the opportunity to feel that they had settled this race. 40 seconds on Argentine. So he's closed back 21 seconds in a couple of miles, and Nevins is going! Jan Nevins is going for the finish, he's still got the climb to come. But maybe he didn't fancy his chance, and maybe they didn't fancy Nevins because they have not reacted. Jan Nevins has gone, and they have not reacted. Well, this is a superb move by Jan Nevins. He knows he could not allow it to go down to the sprint finish because he would not have an opportunity to beat those riders in the sprint. He may have beaten one, but not three. And this is how he won his stage in the Tour de France at Koblenz. He left the field at the kilometre to go, but he's gambled on a long one here. He may have sensed that they weren't paying attention. It was the right time to go before they were getting a little bit more tense, preparing for the attacks that would come. And Navens has got a big gap. This is a superb move for Jan Navens. Certainly the unfancied rider of a victory in Liège, Baston Liège in that breakaway, but if you don't try, you win nothing. And hats off to him. Slips the gears up one. Jan Navens now is on the climb, just about, of the Côte d'Anse, which will take the riders up towards the finish. And the gap is there, very much so now. All of Belgium is hoping now that Jan Navens survives. It was Dirk de Wolf who won last year for Belgium. That was after a series of wins by foreign riders. And now, on the climb itself, Jan Navens, now the legs will start to ache. You've made your sprint, now you've got to settle down and keep the pace high and take the pains that hit you. 
Well, he's done everything right today, Jan Nevens. He's read every move right now. Can he crown it with a great victory? Without doubt, his finest victory in a career which goes back to 1981. Not many professionals have a 13-year career. They reckon the average life of a pro bike rider is eight years, although there are one or two old men of the main field now who would tell you differently to that. Men like Stephen Roach, Phil Anderson, Robert Miller, Sean Kelly. They've all been around a lot longer than that. Now, look at this, though. Well, that has been a tremendous... We hardly saw that acceleration come, but Rominger has gone straight by Jan Nevens on the climb. He's proved to be the great climber of Liège, Baston Liège this year. He has gone past Jan Nevens on this climb, which unfortunately from the helicopter, we can't give you an indication of his gradient, but it's a tough one, and he's flown straight through on him. Tony Rominger, the man of the year thus far, along with Maurizio Fondrias. There's Fondrias. Fondrias has been left because Sorensen has gone through. The break has spread eagle. Rolf Sorensen has come up now. And don't forget, there's never been a Danish victory. Sorensen has just gone past Navens. Now can he catch Rominger? There's Rominger, top end of our picture. Now back into his climber's mode, sitting there. Lovely position. Riding relaxed on the top and all the power going straight through the shoulders into those legs. And Sorensen coming up. The race has gone right across this climb now on the climb of Arns. Rominger needs to hang on because if Sorensen gets him, he should beat him in the sprint. 32 years of age now, Tony Rominger. It's only in the last couple of years this man has really shot to the top as a rider where you expect results from. He knows it as well, Rominger. Leading, this is the face of Rolf Sorensen. He said he'd come here to win, and he's being drawn up to the Swiss champion, former Swiss champion now, Rominger, as indeed he's caught him. A nice deep breath. Now, will he help him, or will he wait to recover? What will he do? Because the other two might recover as well. Oh, dear, Tony Rominger must have seen, felt his heart in his boots then. He's looked across, and he's seen Rolf Sorensen. He knows now that arguably the best man in this breakaway has joined him on his shoulder. These are the two that have been left. Nevins has still found the strength to hang on to Fondriest. He's had a marvellous day today, Jan Nevins. But the two leaders are side by side. That could be a way that Sorensen is indicating to Rominger that he is now the strong man in this league group. He's gone straight into the lead. He's hardly allowed himself time to recover from that chase. A magnificent chase across the gap. Now, Rominger really does have his hands full, providing the other two don't get back. He made his effort on the climb, which is what he favoured most. And now, Sorensen has joined him. Rolf Sorensen, 28 in a couple of days' time. His father was in the 1960 Olympic Games, and Sorensen himself turned professional at 20 years of age. His ambition, he once told me, was to be the world's number one rider. Well, he hasn't made that. But he hasn't won the age best on the age either yet. Beautiful, long, strong legs flashing round the big gears now. A man that would be a bit clumsy on the hills. You can see the difference in body design to Rominger. He's so good on the hills. He dances on them. But now the hills are all behind everybody in this liege bast on liege and the strength might swing across. It was almost a clash of shoulders there with Rominger and Sorensen. Sorensen suddenly allowed a lot of room off the back wheel of Rominger. Now they're probably saying, will this finishing line never come? Because they're over the top of the climb. And it's not far to the line, but they're looking for the red kite in the sky. There's the splits now, and still Argentina is coming. He's even closing in, look, on these two leaders, but it won't be fast enough now, surely. He might pick up second and third. 25 seconds is the gap. Super Belgian crowd. It's been terrible weather. It's cold, it's overcast, it's wet. And yet the crowd has again turned out in their thousands to watch this race. Both riders seem almost prepared to ride in parallel. Just inside two kilometres from the finish, just over a mile to go. The red flag will be in the sky very shortly, indicating the last kilometre of this race. They're not going to let those two riders up now. And Argentina, I'm sure, can't close this gap. Sorensen now wants to recover for a sprint finish. He's continually checking the progress of the other two. He will not, not allow them back. And again, Rominger just seems to sit there and gets on with the job of bike racing. Go back to 1989, you'll find Rolf Sorensen was fourth in the Tour of Flanders. 
finished third in Liège-Bastogne-Liège back in 1981. Now, can he turn that into a victory? The first ever Danish rider to win it. He's ridden such a good race. He was the last rider to read the move and get across to the break. The last one to catch the train on the Haute Levé. And then he was the last one to catch the last breakaway on the final climb when Rominger went. Now, the kite shouldn't be far around this left-hand bend. The barriers are out, so the riders will sense from that that the finish is now not far away. The Italian flag won't help anybody now. There are two riders usually showing classics these last couple of years who are not from Italy in the lead. A Danish rider and a Swiss rider. And uh, at least they can cheer an Italian team in Carrera because that's Sorensen's team. Sorensen, who wants to ride so well and wipe away the memories of a poor Tour de France. I thought for a moment then that uh, Rominger was going to try and attack. There's the kite, that's the one kilometre flag. Last kilometre of what had been a tremendously hard fought number of kilometres on the race this year. Total mileage of 164, 261 kilometres, just one left to go. And this is the chase, and still Navens knows now he's got to keep up the work rate here with Fondrias because Argentine must be right on the wheel. He hasn't caught up, obviously, we'd have seen him, but he's right behind them. Rominger doing really what is coming automatically to him now because he must be feeling a little bit overawed by the fact that Sorensen has counted his move. You know, we've seen mistakes in the last couple of classics this year by riders misreading affairs. And if they misread them, they get beaten. We saw how Ballerini lost Paddy Roubaix. When he should have won it, he was the best rider in the two-man breakaway, but he did not read the wind or the track discipline well enough. Sanson will do well to remember that. Favourites quite often get beaten. A long straight finish, a sprinter's delight, and Sorens is going to make a long run at that banner. Sorens has gone. In fact, Rominger wasn't ready for that move, and he's gone on the far right side. So really, Rominger should have ridden much closer to the barrier to force Sorens to come on his left. He's already given up, and Rolf Sorensen becomes the first Danish rider in the 79 years of Liège-Bastogne-Liège to strike the gold medal. Rolf Sorensen is home. Tony Rominger, the great Swiss rider, comes home in second place now. Can Nevins finish it off for Belgium in third? And it looks as though he can't because Maurizio Fondrius will get his lead back in the World Cup with third place today. About 20 seconds behind and Jan Nevens is there in third place. So the Belgian rider had a magnificent ride for his country today and the Lotto team. He gets third place and there is Moreno Argentin who didn't quite cross the gap quick enough. Coming in 30 seconds or so behind the lead. But I think he'd be quite happy with fifth place. And there is Rolf Sorensen, buried in the traditional melee after the finish. And one or two words from the Swiss journalists here for their champion, Tony Rominger, who had a simply brilliant day dancing around the hills of the Ardennes. Here's the next group in. And it should contain Kierpucci, Ferlan, Yekimov. And in fact, that's Kierpucci who's beating Giorgio Ferlan. So they'll finish sixth and seventh on the day. What a great ride Kierpucci has done. I think it's solely down to him that that breakaway never caught up with that lead group and it paid off in the biggest possible way. Rolf Sorensen, the winner today of Liège, Baston Liège, the Danish rider who predicted he would come and win in the Ardennes, and he did. Here's the big sprint for the rest of the places. Lange Jalabert is the Anse rider who's going to finish it off nicely. He'll get ninth from Stephen Rooks and Gerard Rouet on the line. So a great finish to a great race today. That breakaway almost a fail, yet it didn't. And the chase group never did quite catch up. Let's have a look at the final result of the race. A win for Rolf Sorensen of... Denmark and in second place Tony Rominger one second behind third Maurizio Fondrias officially 21 seconds back the same time as fourth place Jan Navens fifth Moreno Argentin just 37 seconds back in the end sixth Claudio Capucci a minute and five seconds same time as Giorgio Ferland 
in eight was Vyacheslav Yekimov. We didn't see much of him, did we? One minute, 19. And Laurent Jalabert was ninth, bringing over what was left of the main field. This has been a memorable Liège, Baston Liège. And until the next time we meet, I'm Phil Liggett saying goodbye to you all.